we'll do an introductory prayer. If you don't know it, just smile. In the monastery, if you don't know the prayer, you go, whoa. Okay. She perky, Chuk Shing Meto, Tahamri, Tahabling Shi, Ninde Gantani, Shin. Hey, hi. I hope you had a good day off. Good. Thank you for the music. It's very beautiful. Uh, so it was yesterday, I guess. Uh, we went down to the state capitol to uh, a rally in support of uh, stopping uh, a proposal which would eliminate a lot of the incentive to put solar on your house in Arizona. And uh, Scott, you have that photo? No, I mean the whole. Oh, I can see that. Okay, okay. Anyway, I'd like to thank everyone, and I'd like to give you a hand who went, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a question which will come up all over the United States, uh, and it's not an easy question. It's that uh, originally the state legislature, the commi Corporation Commission was very hot on solar power and they made people a lot of promises if they put solar power on their house, including, uh, you know, a big rebates and uh, 
they also guaranteed that the electric company would buy the power, the extra power from you. If they would, you could send it back up the wire to be used in other locations. And um, at, at the same price they charge you. Uh, so, uh, but then too many people started putting solar on their home. And uh, it's, it appears the question in Arizona is that, um, that there's a group making power. They use nuclear fuel in, in Arizona, and they use coal. Uh, and there's a small section of Arizona power that comes from uh, water generated, which was a very wise decision made many, many years ago. And there are a couple of big dams in Arizona that provide that uh, cleanly. So. Uh, so there's uh, people who make the power, and then there's the people who built the telephone poles and all the wires to carry the power, the grid. And then there's the people like us who were supposed to buy the electricity. Uh, but now, uh, because of advances in solar technology, it's, it's, it's feasible to put a solar panel on your house, you know, and generate in my case, it's more than I need. And then, you know, when the guy came to sell me the solar panels, he said, well, gee, you will, your electrical bill will drop to, you know, $5 a month or something. And I said, you and I both know that I will be dead before this pays itself off. <laughs> I'm doing this as a patriot. You know, I'm doing this for future generations. I know I, I will lose money on this. Uh, and he said, yeah, you're right. And, uh, <laughs> but at least there's a small, uh, you know, incentive that the electric company won't charge me. But now they want to charge me uh, to use their wires. So unfortunately, they, they own the wires. And they also own the nuclear, gener you know, they buy the power. So it's kind of a conflict of interest. And um, the, so they're trying to charge me they want to charge me more than I already pay f paid for electricity to use their wire. You see? They want to, I pay like $50 a month, used to, and now they want to charge me like up to $100 a month to sell them electricity for the honor of selling them electricity, you know? So it's crazy, you know, which means that they were giving me the power for free before. Got it? Right, okay, um, so anyway, but they obviously, they need some money uh, because we're using their wires and they're, we're using their telephone poles and if lightning strikes a pole, they have to replace it and I should help pay for that. But I think what has been shown to be reasonable would be like $7 a month or something as my part of their poles, so. Uh, we're trying to get them down from $100 to $7. But in the diamond business, when you sell a diamond, you always say it's worth 10000 If you want 700 that's what they're doing. And, uh, <laughs> or 800 right? So anyway, I think it's important because people are looking at this state to see what happens. And then other electric companies will say, if Arizona being the best place in the world to make sun solar power, said it was okay to charge every customer what they used to pay for electricity just for the poles, well, then it's okay everywhere. You see what I mean? So it's an important uh, precedent for the country. And I think uh, since we are in supposed to be socially minded Buddhists, then I think it's important that we f follow up. What typically happens in a case like this is that, you know, a thousand people show up on the first day of the hearing and then 50 show up on the second day of the hearing, and they make their decision on the fourth day of the hearing when there's nobody there. And then you read about it in the newspaper like a week later. Uh, so I think we have to keep up on it and keep asking questions. Cool? All right. Uh, so those of you who are just getting here, um, we're studying uh, a book called The Meditation Song. Uh, in Tibetan, it's called Kelsang Dingyan. And it was written by the teacher of the teacher of the teacher of the Dalai Lama, the current Dalai Lama. So the grandfather, okay? 
the teacher of the Dalai Lama was my teacher's teacher. And uh, so it's in our immediate lineage. Uh, his teacher's teacher wrote it. And uh, this is an ancient practice, very, very traditional. It's uh, two and a half thousand years old. It's a beautiful uh, ancient tradition that before you meditate, you should kind of stretch your meditation muscles in the way that you would warm up before an Olympic race or something. If it's claimed in, in our immediate lineage, the Dalai Lama's lineage, that if you uh, do this practice before you meditate, then the meditation will be much deeper, much smoother, much more peaceful, much more powerful. So you can go into a very deep meditation. So I think this is a very important practice. Um, I think it's a wonderful practice to teach new people. And I know a lot of you are teaching even here in the valley. We have a nice groups going on in different parts of the city, and I'm proud of that. And I think at some point, I, what I'd like you to do is this week is learn this thing well. And then uh, you're welcome to teach it to other people. If you want to copy it, you can copy it and steal it. If you want a real copy, you can talk to Jigme. Uh, we lost $40 a book uh, printing it fast and giving it away. Uh, so we're kind of going to stop that business next week. Uh, but if you want one, uh, talk to uh, Jigme for the future. I think we'll have 70, uh, we'll have 55 more copies tomorrow for the printer, and we'll give them away for free uh, for the weekend. So I'm sorry if some of you didn't get a copy. Uh, a big group of people stayed up till 2 in the morning for like three days in a row and printed the ones that we had, and we thought that was enough because of the number of people who registered properly. And uh, so we, we had to print some extra ones, and we'll have them tomorrow, okay? Uh, so don't lose heart. If you don't have a copy, I encourage you guys to spread out copies and make sure everybody has one, can see one. That would be nice. Those of you who are teachers especially, and uh, I encourage you, we left 20 pages blank in the back, and I really beg you to take notes because some parts are not obvious. Some parts you need explanation to do it properly. So I'm asking you to take notes in the back, those of you who intend to teach it, okay? All right, we're on uh, the sixth part of 10 parts, 10 classes that we'll be having this week. Uh, the sixth class, class begins the sixth, uh, sorry, the fourth of the six traditional preparations for meditation. That's on page, uh, sorry, uh, verse 45, which is page 29, okay? So, uh, Encourage If you don't have one, maybe try to sit next to someone who has one, okay? If you have two, you might want to spread them out a little bit, okay? Is there anybody who doesn't, can't see a copy? Maybe there's a little pocket over there. Anybody else? Okay. Can you guys have enough light in the back rows to read? Is it okay? Okay. Oh, we're projecting it also. Well, that's nice. That's splendid. <laughs> I, you know, I love your voice. I wish I could talk like that. All right. Uh, section four. What's the first preliminary to meditation? Clean your room. Uh, straighten up your room. A straighten a neat space means a peaceful, well-ordered mind. And what? Uh, set up a, a, a simple altar. A modest altar. Then the second step is, yeah, put some offerings on the altar, like a banana or an orange or avocado, if you think that's a good food. Uh, then, <laughs> sorry, third preliminary. Huh? Take, yeah, sit properly in the seven traditional seven-point posture, and then prepare your heart in two ways. The two ways are on page, what page are those on? 18, okay. I like the photos. For me, it tells a th it's a thousand words, right? On the right is the idea of protection, the two girls under the umbrella. 
And on the left is the idea of love for all living beings, that every person has been your mother in a past life. You have drunk uh, milk from the breast of every person you've ever met in this life. You have drunk their milk, and they have drunk yours. So if you reflect on that, then it's hard to dislike people as strongly. You could probably say the milk wasn't so good, or, you know. <laughs> For me, I mean, personally, I, I do have troubles with some people, and uh, I'm not proud of it, but I admit it. And, uh, you know, when I'm having trouble with them, when I'm feeling grumpy about them, I try to imagine drinking milk from them, and then it, it's impossible to keep that photo in your mind and dislike them as actively as, as normal, okay? So I, I suggest that, I recommend that, if you're having trouble with somebody, just put that picture in your mind, page, page 18, okay? Then shelter in this tradition, in this immediate lineage. Uh, we don't, uh, we're similar to the Jewish tradition. Jewish, I, would, I spoke at a synagogue in Tel Aviv, and then we went to Jerusalem together, and um, I liked it because the synagogue was round, and there were no images. They keep to that idea of no images. And um, we are similar, Buddhists are similar in this tradition, in that uh, we don't believe that a, a statue or like bowing to a statue or praying to a statue or a painting is, is real protection. We believe that in Tibet, uh, a million monks and nuns were killed uh, and they all had lots of statues and paintings and uh, we don't believe that ultimately uh, the picture of a holy being can protect you. We don't even believe that asking a holy being uh, can help you if a soldier is shooting a gun at you. We don't think it's going to help you at that moment. We, we don't believe that. Uh, what we do believe is that an understanding of where reality comes from can protect you. And I'll give you an example. And that's the idea of the umbrella, uh, what we call refuge, right? So just the idea of, uh, it's very common if you have a, what do you call it, partner, a wife or husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, that they might on occasion possibly criticize you or yell at you. And, uh, you know, and it's unpleasant. I, I think the closer you are to someone, the more likely it is to happen sometimes, and it hurts, it hurts more. Somehow you, we are allowed to be meaner to people that we live with all the time in private. Of course, you can't do that when you go out together in public, but you can yell at home. And uh, so it's very heartbreaking when your partner criticizes you or says something bad to you. And in this system, you can take protection, you can take refuge, you can seek shelter. And shelter means uh, understand that this person is criticizing me because of a seed that was put in my mind when I criticized other people. So we believe that. We believe it strongly. It's a fundamental tenet of our, of our beliefs, which is that everything that happens to us happens for a cause, for a reason. And that's because we did a similar thing to someone else. So if we don't like the way people are behaving towards us, in this system, you, you don't so much pray to a, a holy being and you don't so much take refuge in a statue or a painting, but you take refuge in the idea that if you stop doing that to other people, then your partner will stop doing it to you. And it can be third party, right? You can uh, stop yelling at your kids and your partner will stop yelling at you. Or you can stop yelling at employees at work. Or I like to yell at people on the highway although they can't hear me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, stupid, you know. And uh, like if you stop that kind of thing, then you're not putting seeds in your mind, and then those won't grow into a partner who's critical of you. So in this system, you can protect yourself from everything. You can always protect yourself by not doing what you don't like to others, okay? That's real protection in the system, and that is 
in this system is said to be what makes you a Buddhist. So I grew up as a Christian nearby here. And uh, we had a very wonderful ceremony. We had baptism, and then we had confirmation. Confirmation was like, I don't know, we were in high school, and we had to study for six weeks, and then the bishop came to our church, and then he said, you're confirmed, and you can take uh, Holy Communion, or you can take Mass. And uh, that was what made you a Christian, or a certain level of Christian. You were a Christian if you were baptized, and then when you studied enough, you could take the wine and the bread, you know. Uh, that was what it meant. You were confirmed as a Christian. In Buddhism, you are confirmed as a Buddhist when you take refuge. When you respond to violence with kindness, then you're a Buddhist, you see. So you could be a Buddhist and not know you're a Buddhist, and you could say you're a Buddhist and not be a Buddhist. If you yell back, for example, at the moment that you yell back at somebody, you're not a Buddhist. Okay, for a while. <laughs> then, uh, when you remember three days later not to yell back, then you go back to being a Buddhist. Okay, <laughs> it's kind of a sliding scale thing. Okay, so uh, we believe that before you do meditation, uh, you should clean up your room. You should set out an altar, small altar, modest. Uh, put some fresh flour on it or some water bowls. And then prepare your body physically. Park your body in a position that it won't hurt if you sit for an hour or half an hour. That may be on a chair for some people. It may be in full lotus for other people. It depends on your knees or your bottom. And then... Uh, you take the proper meditation posture, but then you prepare your mind also. And you, you go through that idea of the umbrella, and then you go through the idea of the breastfeeding. And, and that prepares your heart. Then now we're on to the fourth. Tonight we begin the fourth preparation of the six traditional preparations for meditation. Uh, this book not only outlines the proper preparations for meditation in our lineage. But at the end, there are a list of subjects for meditation. So part of the book is composed of the traditional topics of meditation. So ideally, you would go through the preparations, six preparations, and then you would flip to the back. I think it's verse 163. And that's where the traditional topics of meditation begin. What are called, we call them Lam Rim, steps of the path, okay? Verse 163. So, I love this book. We made it flat for a reason. We had a special binding put on it so you could lay it down in front of you when you meditate and you can go through the six preparations. I don't anticipate that many of us could do all of them. Uh, I'll tell you what to cut later, okay? Maybe on Saturday. I'll tell you what you can skip. If you do the whole preparation, it's 45 minutes. Most people don't have half an hour to meditate. So obviously we have to make some adjustments, all right? Uh, but what you should do is, is, is quickly go through the six preparations and then start on verse 163 and choose a topic for meditation. And these are the traditional high spiritual topics. Uh, we'll talk about them later, okay? So I'd like you to go to verse 45. The fourth step before meditating is to picture the, what's called sokshin, okay? The, the expanded version of the sokshin is found on page 12, okay? Uh, the picture of the expanded, uh, Sokshin is on page 12. So, you know, if your meditation was really good, you would uh, picture the 200 lamas in, <laughs> or whatever it is on page 12, okay? If you're like me, uh, you reduce it to kundu nobu luk. Say kundu nobu luk. Kundu nobu luk. It means you just smush them all into your heart lama. And that's what I do. After 40 years of meditating, 
I just smash them all together into my heart lover because it gets too complicated for me, okay? And that's fine. That's approved by all parties, okay? Mm -hmm. So on, on verse 45, on page 29, we begin picturing who it is that we would like to invite to the room to help us with our meditation. At step four, we invite them to the room and we try to get them clear in our mind. For most of us, that will mean picturing whoever's your heart teacher sitting in front of you, okay? And that's a very sweet practice. You, uh, you're supposed to use all of your senses and you're not supposed to visualize a, f a photo. You're supposed to visualize a, a, a person, a living person. That's important. When you visualize in meditation, you shouldn't visualize photos or statues. Then you're just sitting with a statue, you see? You should visualize a living person. They are blinking, they are smiling, their chest is rising and falling. I like the fragrance coming off of them. They say that spiritual people have a kind of a fragrance. You know, you can smell it if you're close to them. You can, it smells like honey or almonds or something like that, okay? Uh, so you, step four is to bring them to the room, okay? We've already done similar things um, with a preliminary group, but here's the main one, okay? So if you want, you can reduce it to your heart teacher. Um, and out of, as in, in acknowledgement of the very foundation of our path, uh, he took this part from an older book. He took this part from an older book. The older book is called Lama Chippa, okay? Which may be the most famous prayer in Tibet. Lama means Lama, Chippa means to make offerings to your teacher. So there's a very famous uh, ritual called uh, Lama Chippa, uh, which is uh, we do often together. And basically, it's to picture your private teacher, your own teacher, and to make offerings to them, honor them. Uh, in this system, like I'm thinking to start a beehive, you know? I bought all the stuff online uh, and it was all delivered, you know, these boxes. And uh, I'm into this patriotic thing, like I, I should use solar power. You know, I have now, I'm capturing all the water off my roof. Uh, all, I have 5,000 gallons now and I use it for my garden. And then, you know, solar is coming uh, in a couple of weeks. You know, I, it's already paid, mostly paid for. And uh, I just think it's patriotic to grow some bees because there's not enough bees, there's some problem with the bees. So if everyone had a hive, it would be cool. They're very simple, it's very d simple. They don't hurt you. They don't sting actually, unless you like squash them or something. Uh, those are other bad critters like, what do you call? Yellow jackets and wasps. But the bees, I have thousands of bees in my garden all day. Today they were so loud, uh, I was just sitting there and listening to them, you know, and it's like a kind of a loud song. And they're very pleasant and they're very grateful and they're very nice. You can feed them uh, with your fingers. You can feed them stuff. And uh, so, you know, I was, uh, I, had all the, I had all these beehives ready and, and then I called uh, the local bee guy, you know, they said, okay, I'm ready, I, I need the bees now. This was last uh, June. And he said, uh, you don't get bees in June. And I said, well, um, but I'm ready. I got all the stuff, you know, I want the bees now. And he said, no, no, nobody sells bees in June because uh, it doesn't give them enough time to prepare for winter. They don't have time to make enough winter honey for winter and they'll die. So nobody will give you bees in June, you know. I said, I'm going to get bees, you know. Then I called everywhere in the United States and they all said no. Everybody said no, you know. And then I'm like, they're like, you have to wait until next April to get your bees, you know. And what it means is, you can look online, you can look at all the YouTube videos about how to keep bees, and you can read Bees for Dummies, and I almost memorized it, and this is very monkly. And I also read the Organic Beekeeper Manual, which is like this thick, 
and, uh, but I didn't ask anybody about the bees. And uh, <laughs> any idiot could tell you that you can't, have, you can't buy bees in June, you know. And I just wanted to do it on my own. I didn't want to ask anybody because I'm shy. I don't want to, you know. Then you have to meet them and become friends with them and all this stuff. So, uh, but I realized in, in our lineage, in our tradition, you need a teacher. You need a human teacher, like video, right? Every good director I know uh, studied with somebody else. They, oftentimes they, they made coffee for another director for like four years or something and didn't get paid. And then they became a great director, you see? So in, in our tradition, uh, a teacher is everything. A teacher is everything. You must have a living teacher. You know, you can't have a beehive without a teacher, and getting enlightened is a little more difficult, <laughs> okay? A <laughs> little more to know. So in step four, we invite our teacher to come. In step five, uh, we honor them and make some fresh good karma. We make a hit of fresh good karma like, what is that Rob Haggerty uh, that wakes you up in the morning really hard? He just was working, he's, he's like a manager at Starbucks, and he said, it's so fulfilling, Yeshila. And I'm like, why? And he says, people come in and they're like this, in the morning, you know. <laughs> and then, and then I, I give them their, what's the heavy one that kicks, a kick, gives you a kick? Like espresso, I give them an espresso, and they're like, they're like this. And they just hold it for a while. Then they take a sip and they go, you know, and uh, it's like that. Just before you meditate, you should make some espresso good karma. So just before you meditate, in our lineage, you're supposed to get a kick, some hot caffeine, by collecting some heavy good karma just before you close your eyes. Just in a few minutes before you close your eyes, you should have a karma espresso. You know, and so we visualize my, my teacher, your, your teacher, and then you, you honor them mentally in, in your mind, and then you close your eyes and meditate, because you just collected a lot of good karma, okay? That's step five. We're on step four. Step four is inviting them, getting them in the room. Step five is like honoring them, okay? Step five also involves uh, an espresso kick of what? cleaning out some of your heavy bad karma, okay? Like you do a real quick and uh, very powerful karma cleaning session, just for a few minutes, and then you close your eyes, okay? That's step five. That's step number five. So step number four tonight, what we're covering tonight, we have to invite them, uh, get them in the room, and then we start. After that, we'll be ready to make some good karma with them, okay? The, and again, this section is lifted from an older work by whom? Yeah, Los Angeles Gyanson, Chuki Gyanson, which is the first Pension Lama. So in Tibet, there are two, there are many lineages of Lamas, but the two most famous are Dalai Lama and Pension Lama. And it has worked out historically in many centuries that when the Dalai Lama passes from this planet, the Pension Lama will be growing up and, he, and he'll sort of run things for a while, and then he gets old, and then the Dalai Lama is young again, and it goes like that, okay? So the first Pension Lama was very special, and his, his teacher was Sangye Yeshe. Whoa, where'd that come from? His teacher was Gyawa Wansapa, okay? So the grandfather of the first Pension Lama is said to be, he's, he's always pointed to as a Tibetan who used all this stuff and got enlightened in his lifetime. So he's always pointed to, if you ask a Tibetan of our lineage who's educated, uh, so did you ever see anybody who did this? You know, did this ever work for anybody? Then everyone says Gyalwa Wensampa, okay? Uh, and what he practiced was this section, okay? It's a famous thing. He practiced section four. That was his thing, okay? Guru yoga, he practiced 
visualizing his teacher and honoring his teacher. Okay? So, in the commentaries it says, this section is the one that made a somebody a Buddha. Okay? So it's kind of sweet. Uh, so here we go. Let's go to 40, verse 46. The broad highway of the gods is indivisible bliss and void, covered now with the offering cloud of perfect goodness. Um, and there's a photo there uh, taken out of the windshield of my car like a week ago uh, in Flagstaff. <laughs> but I thought it was perfect, okay? So in this section, we will have a tree very similar to the tree in what famous movie? Huh? Avatar, yeah. I saw that tree and I was like, oh, that's it, okay? That's the tree. You know, in this section, we traditionally, if you want to do the fuller visualization, you can imagine a tree and you can put your llama up in the tree, on a throne in the tree, okay? I always wanted to make a tree house and meditate in it, uh, but where I live, the tallest tree is about six feet high. Uh, so, mm. uh, then I'd like to explain a couple words here. Uh, they're talking about the highway of the gods is a poeticism for the sky and uh, indivisible bliss and void. You should understand that uh, in our tradition, as you start to get close to enlightenment, your body changes. You see, we don't believe you can have a body of flesh and blood and become a Buddha. As you turn into a Buddha, as you get closer to the goal, then your physical body begins to transform. And uh, so this body, the blood and the, and the flesh, will fall apart. It, it always does. They call dosha in Sanskrit, right? In Ayurveda. Dosha means the, the three big constituents of the body, but the word dosha means problem. It, it came into English, uh, D-U-S, came into Greek as D-Y-S, and it means dysfunctional or dysentery or <laughs> the parts of your body, this human body, blood and bone and flesh are fallible and they will fail you. Something will fail. Some, it's an extraordinary system of balances and checks and chemicals and, you know, but at some point it will fail. Something will fail. One of the doshas, one of the constituents of the body will get too strong, another will get too weak, and you will get cancer or pneumonia or something, and, and you will die. So in, the, in, this, in our tradition, uh, our practice involves changing the body into light before death comes. And, and it's a pleasant process. It's meditation is part of it. Going down to the Arizona Corporation Commission is part of it. Taking care of elderly people is part of it. Uh, doing yoga is a big part of it, or some similar practice, physical practice, uh, which addresses your chakras. And chakras are knots in your body, or they're the result of knots in your body, and they help you be mortal, okay? They also choke off psychic channels, nadis, uh, which when they are open, uh, make you very happy. Okay, so when you do a good yoga session and you do your twists and everything, you loosen up knots in your body and then you feel better for a couple hours like that. Uh, those knots open at two junctures in human life. One is the orgasm. When you're having an orgasm, those knots open completely for a tiny period and uh, you feel this jolt or you feel this rush and those those knots that keep your body mortal are open briefly uh, and then they tighten up worse than before <laughs> okay so that's not a preferred uh, spiritual method okay but it gives you an idea of what it would be like what it would feel like uh, if you opened them completely uh, how you would feel the other time is at death as you die those chakras open briefly, and you pee pee comes out, poo poo comes out, uh, blood comes out, and uh, you, those knots are released for a few minutes, 
and then in the next life they retie themselves. So, uh, but we believe that at high stages of meditation, you can open those knots, and you would be in a state of bliss. Uh, in that particular state of bliss, which is brought on by kindness and the service of others and meditation and going to the Arizona <laughs> Corporation Commission meeting. Seriously, uh, that's what opens your chakras. Doing kind things, serving others, taking responsibility uh, that good things happen in the world. And then that opens your chakras and you have this feeling of bliss. At the same time, the flow of prana or inner energy uh, gives you deep insight into reality. So bliss and deep insight into reality are brought on by the opening of those channels. So what he's saying in this first few lines, he's referring to high, high spiritual practices where because of all the times you went to the Arizona Corporation Commission building, your chakras open. I'm not kidding, okay? Uh, your chakras open, and you have a, you, you are in a state of orgasm all day. And then that triggers deep knowledge, deep understanding of, of the reality, okay? So uh, it's, not a, it's not a light way to start a sentence, you know? This sky, I'm thinking about a sky, but it's made of that bliss. And it's made of that insight. He's, he's already gone pretty deep. Okay? That's the insight that makes you a Buddha. Okay? It, what happens when you get that body? The cool thing about that body is you can go to the Arizona Corporation Commission building on every planet at the same time. Okay? You, your body splits into countless bodies. And you can serve countless beings at the same time. Okay? Uh, so it's a very profound way to start a sentence. He says, I'm thinking of a sky, but it's no normal sky. It's not a blue sky. It's a sky, it's the sky of that understanding. It's the sky of that deep feelings of bliss and, and, and insight, and that's the sky. And in that sky, I imagine the gifts, the cloud of the gifts of perfect goodness. In Sanskrit, what? Perfect goodness. Samantha Bhadra, okay. I heard a lot of yoga teachers call it Vira Bhadrasana. <laughs> it's funny. Vira Bhadrasana, okay. Bhadra. Bhadra means uh, excellent. It's the song in Lop Song, right? Uh, and then Samantha is, is totally, okay. Samantha Bhadra. So this is, we already spoke about this, but it's an ancient tradition of imagining the sky filled with clouds of flower petals, rose petals and then dropping them slowly on your teachers. Teachers could be your mom, your dad, they are big teachers. Your last boyfriend or girlfriend who broke up with you and taught you a lot, okay? And in this visualization, you are dropping flower petals on them, okay? Uh, so already it's a pretty heavy, if you understand what this verse means, and I'm sure you have it in your notes now on the last page, uh, you're going to tell your own students, this ain't no normal sky. This is the bliss and voidness. And it's no normal cloud. This is a cloud of offerings, which you make real by two methods. What are they? We covered them last class. Hopefully they survived Wednesday. Huh? Yeah, act of truth. You can do an act of truth. Act of truth means you swear by the truth of something good you did, okay? It could be anything. If it's true that I kept my patience for six minutes with that guy before I yelled at him, then may the sky be filled with roses. May my teacher see the sky filled with roses. Got it? What was the other one? There was a mantra, right? There was a special mantra. Where is that mantra? Uh, verse 39. Okay, we did that mantra. That mantra turns the clouds into flower petals or whatever you want to offer, iPhones that really work, and uh, iOS 7 that's better than 6, and stuff like that. Okay. Mm. Within, this, 
Within this space and cloud stands a tree which grants a thousand wishes, lovely with its leaves and flowers and fruit. This is called Paksam Gishin, okay? Paksam Gishin. It's a special tree. And uh, it's like an Aladdin's lamp, okay? I thought you'd like to hear what the tree is made out of. The, this is traditional description of this tree. I think it's really fun to go uh, get a, go look at Avatar again and look at the tree because it's a tree like that. It's a holy tree. Uh, some trees feel holy, right? I think I've met three or four in my life that were, seemed especially holy. Uh, one's in Phoenix. Um, Sawa Ser, the roots are gold, made of gold. Dongbongu, the trunk is made of silver. Yelka Vaidirya, the branches are made of lapis lazuli. Loma Shell, the, the leaves are made of crystal. Uh, it's already a pretty tree, right? Somebody should paint it for Sunday. Those of you who don't know, we are preparing a performance for Sunday. We're going to do this whole book. Uh, we're all going to do something. If you feel like it, you don't have to, but read a poem, sing a song, do a dance, paint the tree, uh, get the tree out of, what do you call it, avatar and show it uh, on a video clip for a few minutes, okay? By the way, remind me, I have a nice, uh, Jigme uh, was finally successful. We asked the monastery if they could send us a good recording of a monk singing this ritual in Tibetan which I'm not going to teach you because it's <laughs> and I think it'd be weird for you guys. Uh, I think this is one of those cultural things we'll pass on. Uh, but what I thought was, uh, I'll give you a taste of it on Sunday. We got a recording and uh, it turns out that my highest teacher, uh, Geshe Thukten Munchen, agreed to sing it. So it's a very important and you're welcome to have the recording. Let me make sure it's complete because it came in five pieces and I'm not sure we put it back together in the right order, but uh, you could learn to sing it in Tibetan. We spent great effort to put the Tibetan pronunciation in the bottom left-hand corner of each page. So, you know, theoretically you could learn to uh, groan it, I mean um, sing it like that, <laughs> okay? But I'm going to see if I can find a part that you would find attractive in, in the West. The first year in the monastery for me was torture because I used to sing in the choir, you know, and at Princeton and, and there were nice, what do you call it, organ music and then they threw me into this room and everyone's screaming and they're, they're doing cymbals and it was really hard to get that Christmas feeling. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Okay, Dhamma, um, Dhamma, oh, the petals of the flowers on the tree are called Puk. Puk is a, is a jewel called Karketana, and it's a precious stone. I think it's white crystal or something. Uh, the flowers are made of red pearl. Uh, and the... Uh, like that, the fruits are made of another uh, jewel. He says Ashmagarbha. Magard, margad means emerald, so I think it may be emerald, okay. Uh, and so you have to think of a, a tree like that, okay. Yishinki nobutar gudu tamje paktan sampat samgi chungwa. Just thinking of what you want, the tree will grant it to you. It will grow on the tree and you can pick it off, okay. I would like... Uh, you know, a latte, and then it goes, and you pick it off, <laughs> okay, like that. Uh, I'm still describing the tree, okay. I, th I think you should know about the tree. It ain't no normal tree. It's a nice tree. Uh, when the wind moves the branches, they sing uh, songs of impermanence. They sing songs of impermanence. Dust in the wind. Something like that. Okay? No, like you choose something. Do it on Sunday. If somebody wants to, you don't have to sing it. You can, uh, you can do a recording, you know. You could sync it. Lip sync it? Like when I play guitar on, on songs, I have Nick in the back, and, and I go like that, and he's playing it. And yeah. 
Okay. Dagme sok chuki domshi. And they also sing out the, what do you call it? The four songs of the Dharma. The four songs of the Dharma. So I'm going to tell you what those are. Okay. The four songs of the Dharma. Tawakartaki uh, chagyashi. They're called the four mudras also. Okay. Tawakartak means if a book talks about these four things, it's Buddhist book. If it doesn't, it's not a Buddhist book. Okay? If it's not a Buddhist book, in my opinion, it's not worth your time. People ask me, what's your favorite book? I said, well, you wouldn't know. You know, if I tell you, you never heard of it. You know, I didn't read a novel for like 30 years or something. I, you know, you have a choice in your life. You can read a fictional story. There's a way to read fictional stories or go to movies and turn them into practice. Those aren't sweet. Those aren't real. Those are okay. But for informational purposes, if you want something that will really help you before you die, then find a book that has these four things. If it has these four, we consider it a Buddhist book. If it doesn't have these four, we don't consider it a bit of Buddhist book. It could be useful, it could have some meaningful parts, but in the end it's not gonna help you transform before you die, okay? That's, that's our goal. We have a special goal. Okay? Here they are, number one. Duche tamche mi tapa. Anything which is caused by something else will end, okay? Your life, which is caused by your mother and father, uh, all the things you've ever earned in your life will disappear. Uh, all the relationships you ever entered into will disappear, will die. Uh, all things which are caused by other things will die. Okay, that's the first one. You know, you, if, if the book or the philosophy you are looking at or thinking about doesn't, isn't honest about that point, we don't consider it worth reading, okay? Uh, if it doesn't specifically treat that problem of life, that things die, people die, things die, relationships die, bodies die, governments die, cities die, countries die, okay? Everything. Okay, number two, Sakche Tamje Dungyawa. Anything whose creation involved a negative emotion is suffering, and it will cause you suffering, okay? Number three, Chu Tamje Tongshin Dagmepa. Nothing comes from itself, especially partners who criticize you. You see? Nothing comes from itself. On a deeper level, nothing has itself inside of it. A pen, a pen isn't a pen. A fire isn't hot. The girders holding up this building are not made of a material which can hold up a building, okay? They don't have the strength to hold up a building. The, these walls don't have the strength to hold up a building. Without what? Karma, okay? Without you, in this case, uh, without you providing other people with homes or safety, these, these beams will fall, okay? If, if you didn't do that or you're not actively interested in that, then eventually those beams will fall. I gave this lecture at the World Trade Center in 1999. It's pretty heavy. Okay. Uh, it's possible for a human being to reach enlightenment. It's possible for a human being to reach perfection. Uh, immortal capacity to serve countless beings. And that's the goal of this tradition. That's what we do. And if a philosophy or a way of life doesn't embrace those four, then it's, it could be nice, it could be attractive, it could be interesting, but it's not going to help in a big way. Okay? All right. Mm. Why am I mentioning these four? The trees, when the wind blows the tree, you hear this talk. 
coming from the tree. It's whispering these truths. You will die. Do something now. There's a way. It's possible to finish. You can change things. The, the, the tree is whispering that all the time. Okay? It's whispering sweet little ditties of Dharma. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, then you're supposed to imagine uh, in the middle of the tree a huge fruit and on that fruit is uh, a, 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 a vast platform which is held up by eight lions okay? and, and on that platform we're going to invite our teacher we're going to invite our teachers to sit on that platform. Okay. So it's a, already a beautiful visualization. It's very appropriate in, in doing this song that you say, today I'm just going to think about the tree. I'm going to go to verse 46, and I'm going to stop at verse 47. And that's my practice for today. I'm just going to think of the tree and what the trees are singing. I'm going to let the trees sing to me. And if your meditation gets good, the tree will sing to you. Okay? The, the wind in the tree will sing to you. And then, when you go to the forest or the ocean or uh, around here, a mountain, you walk up on a mountain, the, the wind will sing to you. You will hear things on the wind. Okay? Because you practiced to hear. You practiced listening to the wind. Got it? It's very beautiful. It's very, very profound. You know, the sound, the ocean will sing to you. Birds will sing to you. There are special birds going down in the retreat valley. Oh boy. Whew. I'm going to try to get a recording. Something strange happening there. The birds have, something's happening with the birds there. You know, I think they feel the, the vibes of the retreat or something. The, the birds are making these extraordinary songs. Uh, anyway, those lions uh, represent. Uh, bodhisattvas who want to honor your teacher and so they take the forms of lions to hold up the teachers the, the platform that the teacher is going to sit on so it's like you know the Dalai Lama offering to crouch down and you know hold up your chair or something <laughs> these are already high beings and to show who's boss they agree to take the form of a lion, and the platform is supported by their shoulders, on their shoulders, okay? It means your teacher's more important than these high bodhisattvas, okay? For you, you know? All these high bodhisattvas are there, but it's the teacher who takes a human form and tries to relate to you, okay? And I'm not selling myself. I'm, you should find your own teacher. You should find one that fits you. You should take your time doing it, and then, you know, I'm going to try to... I found the best beekeeper teacher in northern Arizona. Uh, he just won't talk to me. Okay. Chase Sengi Tsodu Chinen. Sengi Ridaki Tsog Tamje Silki Nimbatar. And then in the same way that a lion... Uh, what's Silki Numba? You guys know. Yeah, in the way that a lion outshines all other creatures. I guess at Diamond Mountain it's the javelina or something. <laughs> we do have one uh, mountain lion there, and we have a couple bears. Uh, but I think the mountain lion kind of, if you see them, they look a lot cooler than a javelina or, you know, Kodamundi? We have Kodamundis. They look like a cross between a dog and a monkey. They climb in the trees, and, uh, but they don't, they're not like, elegant, or they don't look like Queen Elizabeth or something. It means uh, the lion is uh, among all creatures in the natural world. They are this amazing. If you see a mountain lion, they just strike you with their dignity and their power. You know, raw power. Uh, up close, quite, what do you call it? Shakes you up. Okay. Uh, all right. <coughs> Atop the tree is a throne of sparkling jewels held aloft by lions set with full cushions of lotus, sun, and moon. Uh, the lotus and sun and moon we spoke about before. Uh, the, in ancient times, the sun and moon were perceived as disks. 
uh, as was the earth, and it was thought that you could fall off the edge and things like that. So the word for disk in Sanskrit is mandala. The Spanish word for world is mundo, comes from mandala. Uh, mundane comes from the same word. Uh, and uh, so we picture our teacher sitting uh, on a cushion, three cushions. One is a lotus, uh, one is a moon, and one is a sun. Okay. And then those have a special meaning, and I wanted to cover that. Of course, you're writing furiously in the back of your book so that you can explain these details to your own students. Uh, the, the lotus, uh, what is it? How's it going? Dumle kekyan dumgi kyun ma gu. Dumle kekyan dumgi kyun ma gu. Where's that from? It rises from the the mud, it rises from the dirt, the muck, but it is undefiled by the muck. From Bajogini Sadna, right? Damnai Kekan Damgiki Maku means uh, a lotus flower. If you've ever been to India, uh, you can see lotuses, real lotuses, and they're extraordinary. They're like this big, they're either pink or blue, and they grow, they're s and their smell is, there's no smell, it's unique, it's like creosote or something. If you smell it once, you, you never forget it. It's an extraordinary smell. Unfortunately, the only place they grow is in cesspools. Uh, and in India, they just, they just pour raw sewage out of cities like Bangalore. To get from Bangalore to the monastery, you have to pass through the sewage fields. They just pump raw sewage out into the fields. And it's terrible. For like 10 miles, you can't breathe. You know? It's just raw poop sitting on the ground, you know, pumped out of the city. But these lotuses grow in it, you know. Then you're standing on the berm of one of these fields and you're like, dang, I wish I could get one of those lotuses, you know. And there's always like three little Indian kids and you give them a rupee and they, you know, they jump in and get you their lotus. So uh, maybe that's not so good. Anyway, they, uh, <laughs> you so they say, it's, a, it's funny because if you ever grew something in your house, like I grow herbs and corn and things like that, if, watermelons, but it's so cool to eat something that you grew in your own dirt because the whole thing is made of your own dirt, you know. Somehow, the dirt that gets on your shoes and, you know, tracks through your house, that creates a watermelon or that creates a flower and... And it's weird, like, what does the flower do to take the chemicals out of the dirt to make it bright red? Or This, this month it's, uh, what do they call those things? Uh, I'll think of it. It's a weird, exotic flower. This is the month for those flowers. There's one called borage, if you know borage. It's an herb, it's a tea, and it has a wonderful flower, and the bees like it. Coreopsis is the other one. This is the month for golden and purple coreopsis and, and borage, you know, and the bees are there and they're going crazy, but what is it in the dirt that makes this bright orange flower? What is it in the dirt outside my house? How can it be refined into a bright orange color? I don't know, but uh, it's kind of a miracle. So, in Buddhism, the lotus is a metaphor for what? Renunciation. It means uh, a Buddhist uh, will grow something beautiful out of the most dirty circumstances, uh, the toughest, hardest, most traumatic circumstances. A true practitioner can make flowers grow out of that, okay? Because they're, they're beyond those things. They grow beyond those things, okay? The harder things get. Was it the tough get going? How's that go? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. That's what Buddhists do, okay? The worst things are, the worst people criticize you, the worst terrible things happen, you make something beautiful grow out of it. That's what we do. That's our business. And, and the lotus is an example. So your lama is sitting on that. It means that's the fundamental principle of a Buddhist. We go to the hard places. We don't go to the easy places. You know, we go walk around in the sun downtown you know, you know what I mean? We go, or the prisons, they go to, these guys go to the prisons. They're hard places. 
we figured out when you come out of prison, you want to go to McDonald's. I don't know what it is. We never go to McDonald's, ever. But you're hungry. There's some kind of tension in the prison. And then when you come out, you're like, give me something to eat. You know, and you just want to reassert that you're human. And uh, Buddhists specialize in going to the roughest places and treating the most difficult cases. And we thrive. We, and the lotus is meant, your lama is sitting on that principle. Got it? Okay, next is a, is a sun. And the uh, sun represents ultimate bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is, is ultimate kindness. Ultimate, ultimate kindness is what? Yeah, the perception of, of where reality is really coming from. Okay, can you practice it with your boyfriend in the kitchen? If you're a girl, I mean. Huh? Yeah, you can. How, what would it look like? Yeah, he's yelling at you and you, you think, oh, that came from something I did. Then you start examining the ultimate Buddhist insult is this. You're, you're talking to somebody and they go, it means, where did I, what did I do to create you? You know, it's like, you know, like what, a, what mess up did I do three weeks ago that, that I have to be with you now? You know, and you're like, you're, you're yelling at them and the person's not yet, they don't yell back, a really well-trained Buddhist, they're just like, you know, what did I do to deserve you, you know? And if you want to insult somebody in our group, you can just, <laughs> I like that, okay. Uh, that's all. So the sun is an, a knowledge which burns things and which ripens sweet things, okay? Uh, then the moon is the, what we call the relative bodhicitta or the, what's that? Kindness, just a concern for people, a wish that we could make a perfect world. Making a perfect world takes work, like going down to these boring hearing and listening to, you know. Actually, it wasn't boring, it was kind of cool. I was very impressed by the speakers. The speakers were citizens who thought it was important to go down there and say something, and they were very eloquent. They spoke really, really, I thought they were gonna be kids yelling at the commissioners, but they were, they were all very thoughtful and very kind and respectful, and they, they said very beautiful things. And uh, so kindness means leave a world <laughs> which isn't polluted for your grandchildren, you know? Like, don't use up all the oil. Try to use some sunlight and leave them some. They're going to need oil for packaging to keep food fresh. They're going to need oil to build roads. They're going to need oil for fertilizer to grow food. So leave them a little bit. We can do with sunlight. We can use 50% sunlight. And then leave a little oil in the ground and let them pump it out later. It's like, uh, what do you call it? Leave it in the refrigerator for the, your grandchildren and let them pump it out. You know, don't pump out the last drop you know, and say, good luck, guys, you know, without packaging roads or fertilizer. You see, like, give them a chance. You know, and that's a kind of bodhicitta, okay? So your lama is sitting on those attitudes. It means he is a master or she is a master of those three attitudes. Uh, see the pain in the world, uh, recognize where it comes from, and then wish that all people in the world could overcome this pain. He's, he or she is sitting on those principles. Cool? So this is not an easy practice. This is a very deep practice. To do it right is is cool. I'm hoping that as we go through it, you guys are imagining ways that you can, creative ways to express this on Sunday. Sundays are free for all. Anybody can get up. Even if you can't sing, you sing. Even if you can't play guitar, you play. Even if you can't dance, you dance. I promise to dance if I'm in the mood. And uh, you do something to express one of these pictures in the mind. Can you think of a way to express these three ideas, a sun and a moon and a lotus, and, and express what it means in a performance of some kind? Maybe you paint something, maybe you make a video clip, maybe you Photoshop something, okay, like that. Maybe you put a lotus on Venerable Phil's head, moon and, okay, anyway. All right, we're gonna go about five more minutes and I'll give you guys a break. Mm. 
Upon them sits my heart lama, who has paid me all three kinds of kindness, the essence of all the Buddhas. Um, heart lama here has a special name. Okay, I'm going to tell you the special name. Whoever your lama is, even as somebody asked me, can your dog be your lama? I said, no problem. Buddha emanated as dogs many times. Buddha emanated as the sound of the ocean. Buddha emanated as cars. You know, it's okay. Whatever. Whoever's your teacher, right? In this tradition, they have a name. You ready? Lama, Lopsang, Tubuang, Dorje Chang. One more time. Lama, Lopsang, Tubuang, Dorje Chang. Okay, I'll go through them one by one. Lama means a lama. <laughs> lama just means teacher. In Tibetan, if you're interested, lama means higher one. And it's the translation of the Sanskrit word guru. Okay. Unfortunately, sadly, terribly, the word guru has come to be, mean strange things or dirty things in the West. But in India, it's like rabbi, rabbi or master, or lord, or it's a beautiful word. It's a very beautiful word, okay? So, lama means teacher, okay? Your personal teacher. Lopsang uh, means pure mind, and it's the first name of Tsongkhapa who founded our lineage, okay? In 13, born in 1357. If you want to get into anybody's email account in this group, Type 1357, because <laughs> we all use it. Uh, so that's the year that the teacher, the first Dalai Lama, was born. And uh, we call your own teacher, whether it's your mother or your sister or your child or your dog or your high school teacher or your high school girlfriend or, or your Buddhist teacher or your yoga teacher, it doesn't matter. Your priest from when you were young, your rabbi from when you were young, it doesn't matter. Whoever it is that you honor, we call them Lobsang because that's the, the person who founded our lineage, okay? It's like calling them George Washington or something, all right? All right. Mm. Tubuang means uh, the historical Buddha, okay? The Buddha, Shakyamuni, okay? Gautama. Uh, so Lama means Lama, Lobsang means your teacher is Jatsam Kama, okay? Like one day, my, my uh, principal teacher is a, is a woman from what, that I met when I was 16 or 17. And, uh, and one day I was, I, I translated the biography of Tsongkhapa, right? One day I was at Bumble and Bumble, remember? Uh, we gave a talk in New York City to introduce this book. And it suddenly, in the middle of the talk, I thought, oh, my lama is, is Tsongkhapa. And you know, how can a Spanish a woman be Tsongkhapa. But it just hit me and I said, she is, you know? And then I was like, that's really cool. <laughs> you know? And uh, so you can, uh, if you're in this tradition, if you're meditating with this book, whoever your teacher is, one day I believe you will, you will understand that they are Tsongkhapa, okay? They are the teacher of the first Dalai Lama, okay? Uh, and they are also Lord Buddha, okay. whoever they are. Did you, my mom can be Lord Buddha, yes. Especially Osiris, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, and then uh, Dorje Chang means Vajradhara. Vajradhara is the form that Lord Buddha takes when he teaches the diamond way or the secret Buddha, higher Buddhism. Okay. So whoever your teacher is, it doesn't matter. You can think of them as Lama, Losa, Tuba, Dorje Chang. There are these four beings. Then somebody made a mistake in the original teaching, and they said, uh, Oh, Pabong uh, Krumpache, you mean my teacher's like all four beings mixed into one? And he got very angry in the original teacher, he said, in the original teaching, and he said, Never ever said that, you know. You're, you're, your teacher is not four different people combined. Big mistake. He got angry. He said, they are each one of them. Okay? And they are each other. They are each other. And your teacher is each one of them. Your teacher is not 
the combination of four different people because they're not different. Lord Buddha is Jansen Kappa, is Vajadara, is your personal teacher, even if it's your mom. Okay, they are, and he, somebody said, oh, they're like those Russian dolls. It's like, and he's, no, 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 no. They're not separate. They're, they're not like inside of each other or something like that. Bad thinking. We call it wrong think, right? In Buddhism, we call it wrong think. Don't do wrong think. They are. Your personal teacher is Jatsong Kappa. Okay. In, in Judaism, it would be like saying your, your personal teacher is Moses, not that he resembles Moses or she teaches what Moses taught or something like that. In, in our tradition, you have to treat them as if they were Moses, because they are. Okay? All right. Mm, one more little piece. Do I want to do one more piece? Yeah, okay. I, I lied. Yes, the usual. Five more minutes, okay? <laughs> then we'll have... I bought a really good... I brought a really good chocolate cake that I made today, so... Try to get some of that. It's, it was made with beets, so there's an excuse to eat it. It's healthy. <laughs> with the two pounds of sugar. Okay. Doa di kun sangye nga This is a quotation that is brought up in the original teaching, right? Doa di kun sangye nga da ni kar ken daktan rimo sangtan nang kang du de chen sheja chik pu ni chik pu nyam ni tu me kar ze to all of these beings on the tree are, are the Buddha. Uh, one actor can play many characters in a movie. Okay, just put on different wigs and mustaches and clothes. And, okay, Kang uh, Dejja. Of course, it says in a play. This is an ancient sutra, uh, and they are all bliss, dancing on the on the stage, okay? All of these people in your life who teach you. And of course, the negative teachings are, are probably worth more than the sweet ones, right? The ones who hurt you in your life and, and strengthen you and teach you uh, are probably more important in your life. I th I've found that in my life. Uh, they are all the dance of one person, and that's a great bliss, okay? All the people in your life who helped you, good or bad people, they are one actor playing many different characters in the movie. Okay. And that actor is great bliss. Okay. Very cool. All right. And, and he connects it to Luen. Luen means uh, isolation of body or something like that. It's one of the five great stages of the secret teachings. And I'm sure all the people who finished the seven-year course in that are very familiar with that. I had to look it up again. Uh, but Luen is basically, in the secret teachings, a point that you get to where you can see the peop you can see that the people in your life are one person uh, playing different roles. Okay. All right, last thing, and then I really will give you a refreshment break, and me too. Uh, <coughs> it says here, my heart lama who has paid me all three kinds of kindness, and I thought I would just review them for you, okay? In Buddhism, we believe uh, that your teacher uh, shows you three kinds of kindness, and here they are. Number one, uh, they give you uh, formal teachings, okay? They give you formal teachings. T, it's called T. Uh, number two, they pass on the blessing in those teachings, which is called what? Lung, Lung, Loton Lung, Lung. I did a Jenong in uh, for the retreatants. Uh, when was it? Sunday night. Uh, four and a half hours, they got the Lung for Tara practice. They got the transmission for Tara practice. And it took four and a half hours. It was very beautiful. We had a beautiful time. Uh, so that's called Lung, that kind of transmission of the living blessing of a practice. It's called Lung. And then Laba. Laba means uh, when you're having a rough time and your Lama takes you out to Starbucks and you complain about them and they calm you down and that's called Laba. Personal what do you call it? 
uh, advices or okay, personal advices when you're having a hard time. They can often take the form of uh, what do you call it? Criticism. No student likes it. Only the students who are strong enough get criticized. The lama will be sweet to the rest because they will quit otherwise. So if you get criticized by a lama, you should feel honored. And the more you get criticized, the stronger they believe you are. Okay? It's like an athlete. Like only a really high-class athlete will get pushed by their coach. The other ones will hurt themselves, so the coach doesn't push them. Okay? If you haven't got criticized, it's possible you just didn't do anything wrong. So don't, don't feel bad if you didn't get criticized. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, in the higher teachings, there's a, uh, another version of the three kindnesses. So I thought you'd like to hear those. He mentions them, Pabon Kurpache. Wankur Gyushe Mengak Nawa. Wankur Gyushe Mengak Nawa. Wankur means they give you the empowerment into a secret practice. So they will train you for many years, traditionally train you for many years, and then when they think you're ready, they will grant you permission to study the secret teachings. It's very much like Kabbalah in the Jewish tradition. Okay. Uh, Gyushe means uh, explain those teachings to you verbally. Okay. The, the classical texts of the secret teachings, okay? We have how many scriptures in our canon, traditional canon, Kangyur and Tengyur, how many books? 4,600 4, books, okay? How many of those are tantra? How many of those are high secret classical texts? Over half, okay, over half. Okay, so tantra isn't some weird, uh, what do you call it, sex, chicken killing thing, okay? It's a very sophisticated, deep, beautiful, innocent, pure uh, way of deepening your morality and deepening your practice, okay? Mm. So they explain those texts to you, and then mengak nang means they also give you personal help, personal one-on-one -on -one advice about your life. And those are the three secret forms of what? the three kindnesses, okay? So oftentimes we will refer to a lama not as lama, we will say katin, or katin sum. Those are the three kindnesses. Katin means kindness, okay? We're making a movie, right? We're just trying to write a screenplay, and somebody from Hollywood was interested in it, and uh, the, the, the real name of the movie is katin, okay? Uh, whether they'll keep that, I don't know. Okay, did you want to make an announcement? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, just quickly, we have a bake sale going on in the back. Monk in the golden robes with a single face and two arms, a smile shining forth. His or her right hand is in the gesture of teaching Dharma. Their left hand is in the gesture of meditation. And in it, he or she holds a sage's bowl full of deathless nectar. He or she wears the triple robe of saffron and the golden hat of a sage adorns their holy head. Within their holy heart is the Lord, the keeper of the diamond. The keeper of the diamond has one face, two arms, and his body is blue. That's a translation of Vajradhara and uh, the image on page 32 is Vajradhara. And this is the form that Lord Buddha takes when Lord Buddha teaches the secret teachings. And um, the union of male and female is meant to represent the union of understanding and compassion. So it's not, uh, what do you call it? To a Tibetan, it's no more titillating than, uh, I don't know, a, a, a Rodan statue or something. It just means when a Tibetan looks at it, they see something pure and beautiful and kind. It's kindness combined with understanding, okay? It's not uh, two people having weird things, okay? Don't, don't think like that, okay? Um, this uh, tradition of uh, 
a being within your Lama's heart is, uh, so you have Lord Buddha, and then inside of that is Vajradhara, this, this picture on 32. And if you want to get fancy, in their, in their heart is the mantra on page 36, okay? On page 36, the sacred syllable called Hung, okay? And that's a Hung letter, that's a Hung syllable, okay? So that process is called the threefold being. Uh, a Buddha in the open teachings, regular Buddha image. In that Buddha's heart, uh, a Yabyum, a male and female uh, deity, angels. And then in their heart is the letter Hung, okay? If you want to do it in a traditional way. Okay. All right, then. Uh, in his hands, he holds a diamond and bell, and he embraces the queen of the empty realm. Uh, that's his partner, enjoying his play in simultaneous bliss and void. He wears jewel ornaments of a hundred different fashions, and he is clothed in the, in the silken raiment worn by the gods himself, themselves. His body is adorned with the marks and signs of an enlightened being, and he sits in the midst of a thousand shining ra rainbow rays in all five hues. His legs are crossed in the lotus posture, and the five parts of his being are totally pure, the five Buddhas who have gone to bliss. So uh, we have a tradition in the secret teachings called the five Buddha families, the five Dhyani Buddhas, and this one being represents all five Buddhas, okay? Uh, we have five skandhas, we have five parts to ourselves. Uh, a human being has five components. First one is physical body, okay? Second one is the capacity of sensation, good or bad feeling, okay? Mental or physical, and neutral feeling, second one. Third one, discrimination. I like him, I don't like her. Uh, he's nice to me, she's not nice to me. Okay, like that. Discrimination is the third one. Fourth one? Fourth one is everything else about you. Like, uh, if your name is Phil, then Phil is in the fourth group. Uh, things like that. Fifth group, uh, your awareness, just your raw awareness. Consciousness. Consciousness is such a difficult word. It's so complicated. It's such a long word, consciousness. It just, in Tibetan, it just means you, you, you're aware of the world, you know? If someone, if you fall asleep deeply, you, your consciousness goes down. If someone uh, knocks you out, you, your consciousness level drops. So it's just to be aware, and it's a miracle. It's a huge miracle to see colors, and to see trees, and to see the sky, to meet other people, to hear songs, or touch to feel the carpet on your feet, uh, or the earth in your hands. These are miracles. Each one is a miracle. So the five parts of a person are uh, called the five heaps, or the five, five components of a person. Why don't they just say body and mind? Why do they make five? Yeah, t the second and third are what cause you to be suffer, okay? I like him, I like her. Why? He makes me feel good. She doesn't make me feel good, okay? What is it? Korlu Gyuchu, Rim Gyuchu, Pumbo Nam Le Tsoa Dan Dushi Lokshi Pumbo Shat, Abhidhamma Kosha, first chapter. We divide into five because two of them cause the, all the pain in the world. I like that, I don't like that. That feels good to me, that doesn't feel good to me. I like her, I don't like him. Like that, okay? Uh, as we become enlightened, as we reach enlightenment, each one of those five becomes purified. Each of them becomes pure, okay? And, and each one becomes a separate Buddha, okay? It's very interesting. So your physical form uh, turns into light, and your feelings reach a high level of equanimity towards all people, total love for all people, 
and then your discrimination drops and you treat all people equally whether they would make you feel good or bad and then uh, your your identity as Phil or Anatole or Aaron uh, is lost okay you you become Buddha okay <laughs> you will still be a individual and you will still be feel an individual but you nobody will call you Aaron anymore you are the Buddha Lord Buddha okay it's like that so uh, that's the purification of the fourth heap and then the fifth one is your mind uh, is able to see ultimate reality and normal stuff at the same time and only a Buddha can do that okay so uh, each one of those is a separate Buddha and the person in, in front of you in the tree, right, on the tree, is uh, all five Buddhas in one, okay, all five Buddhas combined. Those five Buddhas, which represent the purification of your five parts, they each have uh, a paradise, they each have a partner, they each have s s disciples of their own, and they each, uh, one of them, Has, has taught separate commitments that will help get you enlightened. So there are commitments, 14 I think, what was it? 19 uh, of the five Buddha families. There are certain commitments that you make in the higher teachings, in the secret teachings. Anyone who has had a proper initiation or empowerment into those five Buddhas, into secret teachings, takes uh, commitments that relate to these five Buddhas, okay? And they are very beautiful commitments. They are very kind, they are very innocent, they are very pure, and they are very deeply rooted in morality, okay? So they are uh, very beautiful, very, very sweet uh, commitments. So that's, your Lama is the source of all, all secret commitments also, because all five Buddhas are part of your teacher. All right. Mm. Some of those beings, I mean, if you, I'll give you their names just for good luck. Vado Chana is the first one. When you purify your physical body, uh, that's Vado Chana. White color. Um, second one is Amitabha. Amitabha. Uh, Amitabha means uh, immeasurable, and Bha means light. Ba, Amitta Ba, came into English, in, came into Greek as photon, came into English as photograph. Ba, Ba, po, became Po, Fo. Uh, Amitta Ba. Uh, that's the purification of your, uh, actually the third heap, discrimination, okay, red color. Uh, the purification of your consciousness, and this is a traditional, traditional order of them, is uh, called akshobhya. Uh, akshobhya, and it's a blue color. And the purification of your feelings is called uh, ratnakara, ratna akara, ratna akara, which means a source of jewels. And that's a yellow color. And the purification of your identity, say, is uh, Amoga Siddhi, okay, which is a green color. Each one is also related to overcoming a separate negative emotion. So if you're interested, okay, <laughs> this is more than you ever wanted. But I think it's nice. Uh, uh, Vairochana is connected to stopping your misunderstanding of your world. How would you misunderstand your world in the case of your partner criticizing you in the kitchen? Yeah, if you yelled back, it would prove that you don't understand where they came from because they came from yelling. So if you yell back, it proves that you're, what do you call it? Stupid Buddhist, okay? <laughs> you're just creating more problems, okay? And then overcoming that misunderstanding where your partner came from is is connected to Vyochana, the first Buddha, okay? Uh, overcoming your 
ignorant desire is related to amitabha. Okay, amitabha. What's ignorant desire? Uh, you walk into a Dunkin' Donuts at midnight after this class, and there's one maple-covered donut left, and uh, you're about to buy it, and you hear an, older, an elderly woman behind you who says, I love maple-covered donuts, so you buy it faster. Uh, so you're sure that you get it, and you believe that that's how you get it, is to buy it. But really, you get the donut you want by sharing them with others. So we divide desire into legitimate desire or intelligent desire and stupid desire. Stupid desire is to take the last donut and not share it, because then you won't get more. Uh, legitimate desire is, uh, you know, I would like to have a, a nice, uh, healthy meal tomorrow, so I will provide meals to other people. And that's legitimate desire. It's, desi it's a good desire because it involves helping other people to get the things you want. Okay? That's fine. That's intelligent. The Dalai Lama calls it, what do you call it? Enlightened self-interest. Okay. Uh, the third one, uh, Akshobhya is the purification of anger. Responding to your boyfriend negatively. Uh, the fourth one, uh, Ratnakara, is connected to pride. And the fifth one is connected to my specialty, which is what? Jealousy. Okay. All right. If you want teachings on jealousy, let me know. But don't tell me someone else did a better job. Okay. Uh, all right. Verse 49, the four elements of his or her, okay, body, are the four holy women, his doors of sense and his tendons and joints and ligaments are actual bodhisattvas. The pores of his skin are the 21,000 destroyers of the enemy, and his limbs no less than the lord of the angels fears. The rays of light are the protectors of the directions, spirits of harm secret the world they provide his platform. Surrounding him are rows of my direct and lineage lamas and masses of close angels, angels of the secret world. The four holy women are partners of the, four of the five Dhyani Buddhas, and that's a long story, okay? Uh, and here's some of the commentary that's traditionally given on this verse. Uh, each poor of your teacher's body, each tiny hole in the skin is a Buddha paradise. Okay? And uh, you can say, oh, that's exaggeration. No, it's under, what do you call it? What's the opposite of that? Every atom of his body or her body is a Buddha paradise. Okay? The, not just pores, okay? But uh, someday, you will appreciate that, and you will understand that. But in the meantime, it doesn't hurt to believe it, or to think about it, or to imagine it. It doesn't hurt, right? Uh, every, every little tiny hole in my teacher's skin is inside. There are Buddhas living in their own separate world with their own disciples and their own paradise. And, uh, it's a sweet thing to imagine, okay? We are... Buddhist, we are Dalai Lama tradition. Uh, we are not, uh, this sounds weird in the Western country, but it's just that it hasn't, we, they didn't get used to it yet. Okay, so to be careful with those things. I don't think they are weird or something. It's not weird in our tradition to believe that you're inside your teacher's skin are living thousands of enlightened beings. Okay, it's not a weird thing in, in our teaching in our tradition, okay? It's not occulty or weird or something like that. It's just the way it is, okay? Like there's stars in the sky and there's Buddhas in your teacher's skin and that's how it is. Okay. I think we have to be, you know, don't be discouraged when people think you're weird or they, they think what you think is weird or... That's okay. They'll see them someday and they'll apologize to you. Yeah, you know, and 
just relax and smile and say, yeah, we're a little weird. But we're kind of harmless and weird, you know. And, you know, we're just trying to get extra donuts. And stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, then they say a cute thing. They say uh, those little holes in your teacher's skin are like, have you ever been to Grand Central Station in New York uh, on a busy day? Uh, trains leaving. You know, I used to, I lived in the Port Authority. This is the bus station in New York. There are many, many ramps come out of the building, like on the third floor, the fourth floor, the fifth floor. And they're like, cool. They, they circle around the building and they head for New Jersey or they head for upstate New York or they go to the Water Gap or there's thousands of buses leave there. It's an extraordinary building. It's terribly polluted. Our first center was under that building. And you could go out and hold your hand like that and it'd have, you'd have a little layer of black dust on your hand in like two minutes. And uh, we, didn't we couldn't afford anything else. And uh, just thousands of buses. I think uh, in my time, two million people came into New York at 9 o'clock. And two million people left New York at 5 p.m. Imagine moving two million people in and out of an, an island, a small island, with only a few tunnels, you know, it was wild. And, and in the pore of your llama skin, there's that kind of buses going out, uh, emanations, you know, beings going out, you know, emergency call, we need a Buddha on this planet, you know, and then, <laughs> you know, and there's like, you gotta, you're supposed to imagine like this intense, activity at each pore, people coming, people going, you know, missions to Beijing, you know, or whatever, uh, going out, being sent out, thousands and thousands of them leaving and coming, uh, emanations, okay? It's a beautiful image, okay? Uh, then uh, Pabon Kormache is careful to say, the 21,000 mentioned in verse 49 is just a random number that means a lot. Okay, so don't think it's only 21,000, okay. Uh, he says a beautiful thing. He says, look, if you're, if you're sleepy and you gotta get to work and you don't have time to close your eyes and visualize every being coming out of the pores and skin and all that, just relax, he says, for God's sake, just relax and get into the feeling of it. He, he says that. He says, if you can't get Buddha number four correct and he's got too many eyes, or, you know, just for goodness sake, just relax and, and feel it, you know. Ooh, that's cool, you know. So cool. And just get into the cool and, and don't worry about getting their eyebrow right and, you know, he says that's a problem in meditation. If you get hung up on the visualization, don't, don't do that. He says, get the feeling right, and you're okay, you know. Just, your llama's sitting there and some amazing stuff is going down. And just be happy, you know. Like, wow, that's cool. He's cool. She's cool. That's enough. Like, if you don't see the beans coming out of her skin and everything, don't get, what do you call it, uptight about it. Just relax. Get into the feeling of it. It's cool. Lights coming out. Helping people. It's enough. Get into the feeling of it and don't worry about the picture, you know. Okay. He's very uh, adamant about that. Okay. Uh, the rays of light coming off of your Lama's body are the four lineages which we will learn about later. Okay. Nick knows them because he translated the poster or much of the poster. But there are four great lineages. One is of compassion. Uh, one is of understanding your world. Uh, one is called uh, the secret teachings, okay? And the fourth one is called Che Del Le Top. Say Che Del Le Top. Che Del Le Top, okay? Uh, these are all the teachers with whom you've had direct contact in your life. It could be your fifth grade teacher, which in my case was the worst one, Mrs. Butts. I, she, that was her real name, and she was. And, uh, you know, your mother, your father, 
old boyfriends, girlfriends, first wife, you know, people, your pets, people who taught you, two old German shepherds, <laughs> whatever they may be. And uh, these are called Chudongutong. Ch means Dharma, right? Dal means connection. So people who you've had direct human contact with and they've taught you in this life are called Chudong Mutob Lama. And that's the fourth lineage. Okay. In in the monastery it's very common if a very famous Lama comes uh, to visit, then there'll be a waiting line outside the door and people will come in and ask for one verse of teaching, like two minutes of teaching, and they'll say, I just want a Chuddo with you. I just want to make a karmic connection with you. And then in the next life, you can, you can be my teacher for my whole life. But I, I just want to make a one-on-one -on -one connection with you. And that's called chuddo. So all of those teachers in your life, school teachers, sports teachers, you know, uh, parents, family, girlfriends, whatever, they are, they are a separate lineage for you. And they are part of the light coming off your body, the body of your teacher. Okay. Mm. Next verse, 50. He sits circled in this by a sea of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, warriors and their angels, and the protectors of the word, all marked by the triple diamond of the three doors of expression. And then from letters Hung fly rays of light in the shape of hooks, beckoning beings of wisdom from the land of reality, drawing them in to melt indivisibly, turning them perfectly firm. Uh, so it's a tradition to imagine that uh, lights are flying out with tiny little hooks on the end and they're hooking like Mahatma Gandhi wherever he is now or you know Lord Buddha wherever he is now and, and well, I used to fish with my dad it's a terrible thing but I used to do it and you know you have this fishing pole and you like he would take us deep sea tuna fishing and they're very difficult to bring in and and you'd have to fight like that and, and go like that and then go like that and then go like that. And, go like that. and uh, so you have to do that with all these holy beings, all right? You bring them in, hook them and bring them in, okay? Bring them into you. Bring them into your teacher, okay? Those are called uh, wisdom beings. And it's a tradition to invite them or to actually you are hooking them and bringing them in, drawing them in like fish. And then you, you, you squash them into your llama. You stuff them into your llama. Okay? All right? Okay. Then there's a mantra for that. Okay? And that's the last thing we'll do tonight. Here we go. Is it the last thing? Nah. I still got six minutes. Uh, let's do the mantra anyway. Say, say ja, hung, vang, ho. Ja, hung, vang, ho. This is a, a mantra that's used in the secret teachings, but uh, we're allowed to explain it in this book. Uh, when you say ja, you have to think you are hooking them. So this mantra makes them come. Okay, supposedly if you do this mantra with a good heart, uh, those beings will come. Okay, so ja, I want Mahatma Gandhi inside my teacher. Okay, ja. You see, ja. And then hung means get them, get them into your teacher. And then ja uh, hung. Vam means uh, lock them in. Ching, we call it ching. Lock them. Ja hung vang. And then uh, ho means uh, they're like, like if you're bringing Mahatma Gandhi into your teacher, right? In my case, a, a, a lady, the teacher's a lady. So I'm bringing this old, bald Indian yogi into this teacher, and I'm going, ja, hung, bang. And then ho means, Mahatma Gandhi is like, it's pretty nice in here. I like it. <laughs> Nyepa means, uh, he's like, that's, I kind of like being here. I'll stay. Okay. You lock him in, and then he's like, that's cool. This is a nice place to be. Nice in here. Okay. When you say ja, hung, bang, ho, you, you bring them in, you lock them in, bring them down, put them in, lock it, lock the door, and then they're like, 
I like it. Okay, got it? Ja Hun Van Ho. Say Ja Hun Van Ho. Good. Okay, I got a few minutes left. Uh, last thing, and I have to go too. My old lady's waiting for me with some enchiladas, I think. My 87 year old girlfriend. Uh, but, uh, so I gotta go fast because she, she gets to, she should be in bed by now. Uh, me and <laughs> Christine, we took her out to a concert. It was really sweet. Uh, Sergi Sergio Mendez and Brazil 66. <laughs> okay. Deon Chendengepa Grupo Minte. The commentator is careful to say, you don't have to invite these beings. Okay? You don't have to issue invitations. You don't even have to ask them to come. Okay, technically you don't have to say, I wish Mahatma Gandhi will come. Okay? Thinking it is enough for them to come. Okay? Like, if you want your teacher to come to the room, if it crosses your mind, they hear it. Okay? If the thought crosses your mind, they hear it. You don't have to say, oh, please to come, teacher. Technically, you don't have to say, please come to my room, you know, like that. You just think, it'd be sweet if you were here. Boom, they're there, okay? Like that. They have that power, okay? They're listening to your mind all the time. Your mind is just like, I don't know, the icing on the cake that they're eating. You know? They're like, oh, he wants me to come. Then they just come, okay? You don't need to ask. Then they... they they tell the story of the lady, lady from Magadha. Okay, we told the story already. We did all this. You just don't remember. Uh, Magadha Sangmo. Okay, this lady from Magadha. It's a very famous story in a sutra called Do Zhang Lung. Say Do Zhang Lun. Zhang is an ancient, 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 ancient word for wise person. Lun means fool. It's the sutra of the wise and the, and the fools. The wise people and fools. It's very, very beautiful. It'd be wonderful to translate someday. But there's a story in there about... Okay, I'm going to tell you this story. It's kind of sexist, I guess, but I didn't write it, so don't blame me. Uh, Lord Buddha did. Uh, she was uh, born a princess in uh, Magadha, which is an ancient kingdom of India in the time of the Buddha, and uh, she was very homely, okay? She was very, uh, very homely, but she was born the princess of a king. And then the king uh, had a hard time getting her married because nobody wanted to marry her. And then uh, one day, one of his subjects, a nobleman, told uh, the king, I'll do anything you ask me. And he said, take my daughter, <laughs> marry my daughter, you know. And he, then he saw her, and he was like, oh, no. And, uh, but he took her home, and he, and he locked her in a box, a huge box, okay. Uh, and he kept the key in his, what do you call it, vest pocket. And, uh, and so uh, he had to drill some holes in the box so, to give her food and stuff, and and uh, and then, uh, what's the story? There were a couple of people who were curious. They heard about that he was married to the king's daughter, and they thought she must be extremely beautiful if he locks her up in a box, that he's so jealous of her beauty that he doesn't want anyone to see her. And uh, they decided to get the, the nobleman drunk and steal the key from his vest pocket, and they did. They got him drunk and got it, the key out of his vest pocket. And they're headed over to the, his rooms to get into the box and see the lady there. In the meantime, it crosses her mind that it would be sweet if Lord Buddha were in her room, and he's in the room, okay? Like, it's the example used in scripture for the minute you wish your lama was there, your lama's there, and you don't have to worry about it. Don't stress, okay? Just say, I wish my lama was here in your heart, in your mind, and they, they are there because they're listening to you, 
all the time. They're listening to your mind all the time. So she's like, it'd be sweet if Lord Buddha was here. Boom. And she looks out the hole, and all she can see is the halo around his head. Like, she can't see the whole Buddha. She just sees the halo. And it's like, she's, oh, it's so beautiful, you know. And her karma changed. Seeing the halo and thinking the, the Buddha was beautiful changed her karma, right? And they open the box and this stunning woman comes out. And uh, so that's the story. <laughs> it's kind of sexist. But anyway, uh, the, I, the point of the story is that the minute you wish your teacher was there, uh, they are there. Okay, last thing. <coughs> The measure of the blessings you receive from the presence of your Lama after you invite them mentally in your heart is dependent upon how strongly you believe they came and nothing else. Okay? It's just your own faith that they are there which creates the karma. Okay? So that's cool. So they said the degree to which you believe they are present determines the blessings you will receive from them. Okay? And that's all. The degree to which you believe they are actually there determines how much blessing they can give you for what? If you tell me the answer, we all get to go home. Your meditation, the meditation you're about to do, okay? So the degree to which your meditation is blessed is completely dependent on how strongly you feel that they are there. And that's up to you. He says, I can't do anything about that. They are there. The minute you wished they were there, they were there because they're listening to you all the time. And they have, no, they have no limitations of space and time. They are free to come wherever they want. Because of sungjuk. What's sungjuk? Buddhahood in the secret teachings. Why would that imply that your lama can be there as soon as they wish to be there? Because sungjuk means what? Clear, the union of clear light and a rainbow body. And they are, they are linked. As soon as they hear you, their body is there also. Because they're sungjuk. They, they attain Buddhahood. Okay? They have clear light, the mind of a Buddha, and they have the rainbow body, the body of a Buddha. So as soon as they hear you, their body is there also because they are chief sungju. Got it? If you nod, you get to go home. Me too. Just nod. Okay, you can go like that. <laughs> uh, Esther, do you want to tell us a little bit about tomorrow, what's happening? Thank you for coming and thank you for letting me do this class because it means a lot to me. This text means a lot to me. <laughs>